So happy to see so many of you committed to a six month study and many of you have come quite far away from your homes and uh, I congratulate Swamiji here who I guess uh, it will attract people, keep them committed and uh, is able to impart knowledge to everyone. So no question that all of you are very fortunate that you came here, you found this very Swami is there, Swami is there, both of them. <coughs> so when I see one of you, that's the only place I see is the dining hall mainly. So many of them so sincerely uh, serving, helping. What are you? That's what Bhagavad Gita teaches. The teaching, Bhagavad Gita, as far as the Karmayava is concerned, can be simply uh, say to be seva. Karma Yoga is basically the karma of the duty performed with the spirit of Seva. So in Seva, when I am serving somebody, then the need of the somebody who I am serving becomes more important than my own need. I have my own needs. But when I am serving you or somebody else, the seva can be properly done only when your needs, needs of savior whom I am supposed to serve, becomes more important than my need. This is the concept of duty of Kartavya in the Vedic culture. Kartavya is that which has to be done. This is a very unique concept in the Vedas. When a person feels that I, I should do something, it's my duty to do something. The idea of duty of Kartavya is not very unique to the Vedic culture. There's all those who grew up in the Vedic culture grew with the idea of duty, that this is my duty. Even in the home also, often the relationship is one of duty, that I'm duty bound to my parents or my siblings or those who depend upon me. That concept of duty is a very beautiful concept. Call it duty, kartavya, dharma. Because when I am duty bound to you, then your need becomes more important than my need. And more often than not, Performing duty requires me to let go of my needs, to serve the need of one to whom I am bound by duty. So the idea of duty almost always involves a spirit of letting go, we can use the word sacrifice, as of self-sacrifice is always involved in the idea of duty. So there is no separate karma yoga. When dharma is there, duty is there, the duty automatically involves the spirit is required to perform karma, the yoga is the spirit of self-offering. Yajnyarata, karma yantra, lokoyam, Karavandana, third chapter, Lord Krishna says that here, you know, when you perform an action in a spirit other than yajna, yajna means self-offering, basically. It's what is called Vishkam Karma, selfless action. 
an action performed in a spirit other than selflessness is an action that binds you. Already say action binds you. Action does not bind us, action doesn't do, doesn't free us. It is not the action that binds. It is what goes behind the action in terms of attitude with which I perform the action. If my attitude is one of what is in it for me, what do I stand to gain by doing this? Which is the usual uh, attitude that a human being has. For self-interest is the most important thing for me. Atmasukamaya, the Upanishad says that everything becomes dear to you because self-interest is dear. Atma means self-interest. So what is most important, dearest to me, is self-interest. Heart must mean, it is for the sake of me that everything becomes dear. It is for the sake of self-interest that other things are important because they serve my interest. So this is a kind of uh, nature that we are essentially inherited. And so this self-centeredness is a basic uh, attitude of the human being which arises from a sense of insecurity. I feel insecure as I am. And there is always in my there is always an apprehension that I'll be taken advantage of, I'll be exploited. I will stand to lose something if I have the spirit of giving. So then the self-interest is what governs most of my dealings. And when I am successful in serving mind, in manipulating you, such that my interest is served. To serve my interest most of the time requires manipulation. So things go my way. And when I do that, when I'm able to do that, usually I feel successful that I got what I wanted. So for a human being, the idea of success is generally that the self-interest is served, that I could get what I wanted. This idea of success that human being generally has. And they say that comes from a sense of uh, insecurity, sense of lack or want. And again, as you know, that comes from ignorance. But not knowing that, this self-centeredness, which I think that whenever I'm able to Fulfill my self-centeredness, I feel a sense of success, accomplishment. Not knowing that that is in fact damaging me. So I want the tendency of self-interest. And I think that that is what uh, is success for me whenever my self-interest is served. And then usually my life is in serving the self-interest. And in so doing, more often than not, I manipulate things so that my interest is served. Like my friend and used to say, hey, a great saint, when devotees would come to him and, and there was one devotee, he would always bring a lot of uh, sandalwood. Sandalwood. So he would come and apply sandalwood to the feet of the Swami and then prostrate to Swami and his feet. By doing that, he <laughs> take a post of that sandalwood on his forehead. So how even in the act of supposedly serving or giving, how the human mind is seeking to fulfill its own interest. Because of insecurity. What will happen? The insecurity comes, of course, from a sense of lack or want. 
which in turn comes from ignorance, not knowing that sufficiency is my nature. It's so sad, I don't know why we are stuck with this kind of a thing, this so-called ignorance, which is a very uh, dangerous thing because where there is total self-sufficiency, it creates and we the notion of insufficiency. That's totally contrary. And then I feel insufficient, which is a legitimate feeling. Feeling insufficient, lack or want, is not a legitimate thing for me, who is Brahman or wholeness or completeness by nature. What a tragedy it is that one who is complete by nature, totally self-sufficient, without any needs, always feels needy. So I'm always a needy person. And I approach the world from the platform of neediness. From the platform of neediness, fulfilling my needs. And then I'm always begging for the sympathy and favor of the world. Because that's the only way my need can be fulfilled. When I get the sympathy of you know, the world. And if you don't say that I do that, I manipulate also. So this is the way human being lives a life, thinking that by thus accomplishing my needs, I am a successful person. That is a, that is a definition of success in the world. Not realizing that that is a success which keeps on damaging me. Because I keep on giving reality to my neediness, which is a wrong thing. It is a notion or a drama or delusion born of ignorance, and I don't even know that. I don't know, I do not know that what I take myself to be is quite contrary to what I really am. And so many I keep on fulfilling my self-centeredness all along. And so that is a main obstacle to freedom. Self-centeredness is a primary obstacle and that is the primary reason for all sorrow. Self-centeredness is the primary reason for all sorrow. Because why well, you feel happy when that self-centeredness is fulfilled, but more often than not it's not because Self-centeredness is clash, you know. I am self-centered, others are also self-centered. Then the likelihood of my self-centeredness not being fulfilled is greater than it being fulfilled. And so the, the likelihood of sorrow in my life is much greater than of satisfaction. So poor human beings seem to be destined to be a sorrowful creature. And there is nobody in the world who is more sorrowful than Human being is the most sorrowful creature in the world. Cats and dogs and buffaloes and cows are far more fortunate than we are. They don't have depression, they don't have sadness. They don't depress dog, they don't depress buffalo, they don't depress cat. Have you seen them? Maybe you may, if you have a pet, then it's possible. It's amazing my dog feels depressed. I say, how long have I been with you? Possibly <laughs> <laughs> he with us for the length of time, he inherits some of our uh, traits. So we infuse some, some of our uh, sadness at the time to them. <clears throat> but if we are street dogs, they are never sad. They are never depressed. All I'm saying is that the sadness, etc., is a unique uh, feature. Of human being. So somebody who says better to be a buffalo than being a human being, buffalo is not no worry at all in the world. Would it not be better to be buffalo than being a human being? No. Because nobody human is only a sad creature is human being. Nobody else is sad. If you hit a dog, it may momentarily react and you forget it. 
if you don't hate me, if you do a little bit, you know, just use a couple of words and that thing will remain with me for one week. I'm so sensitive. And so, is it not better that we become a fellow who has no sadness? Isn't this sadness really a great curse for the human being? Human is only creature who is sad, I tell you. Nobody else is sad. Nobody else is depressed. Nobody has psychological problems. Unless these are bad others, nobody has any such problems. So would it not be a good idea to be uh, maybe a dog or a cat or a buffalo? Not don't you think so? Is not sadness a curse upon the human being? No, they say the pain is saving grace. How would it be if there is no pain at all? Then we will die. The pain draws my attention to what needs to be corrected. The pain in the stomach, then it draws my attention to how many weight, too many rise, and too many stays, and so on. At 4 o'clock in the morning, all kinds of things happen in my stomach. Because the evening and sambar and bar and a nice helping of those things. Knowing fully well that my stomach cannot deal with those things. But when it comes to that, you know. So this pain in fact draws my attention to something that is abuse or where I have violated the order. This pain or sorrow comes when we violate the order. So whenever we feel sad or unhappy, we can generally assume that we must have violated some order in some way. So thus, just as the pain in the stomach is, to draw my attention to the abuse that I have done to the stomach, so also this sorrow in my mind is only draw my attention to something where I have perhaps, uh, you know, uh, violated some harm, some law, some order. So that way pain also is a blessing. Blessing in disguise. Because it draws our attention to something that needs to be corrected, otherwise we will never do that. And so, uh, that human being as pain is a, seems to be a curse when the human being can be sad or in pain. We may think that we are most unfortunate because uh, we are stuck with this pain or sadness, but in fact that is a gift given to us. But that is when you want to correct something. That's when you recognize. Uh, you know, I never felt the need to do anything. Until he felt sad, where did he, wherever he felt sad, it happened to be in the midst of battlefield, okay? But that is when he became conscious of something deep within himself, which is there in all human beings, but then we usually keep ourselves occupied or busy with one thing or the other and then we're avoid addressing what is in there. But then also want to avoid. So he says, Lord Krishna, no, you would say, I will not fight the battle, so let us get, get away from here. Lord Krishna did not uh, cooperate. As you know, the master is your command. Lord Krishna, let us drive our chariots, let us leave this battlefield and fight. But Lord Krishna did not listen, did not respond, did not say anything. So as you know, thought there is something wrong here. In my decision of not fighting, there is something not right. So that much respect he had for Lord Krishna, fortunately. The ordinary chariot was gone, let go. But here this was Lord Krishna, he knew. And therefore he had no way to escape. Usual response is to escape the pain. Pain comes, you want to escape it, avoid it. Take a shortcut. And that's what Arjuna also, the pain of fighting this battle and the possibility of, uh, you know, the death of so many near and dear ones, it is sad for anyone. And Arjuna was a sensitive person. Maybe the Yuna may not have felt that much. But we can see how sensitive Arjuna is. That even the possibility of death of people, they made him so, so sad. So that is one of the requirements, in fact, of sensitivity. 
Because of sensitivity, we feel sad also, but it's that sensitivity which ultimately uh, makes us free also. To be sensitive, to feel pain, sensitive to know Brahma also. So you Arjuna know, was sensitive. And that's why he could feel the deep sorrow which is heart of every human being. Arjuna's sorrow is not something that is unique to Arjuna. He is there in the depth of every human being. But usually a person keeps keeping himself busy with something or other and not addressing that. When I don't feel good and I take a piece of candy and I go for coffee and I go for something or other and take a shortcut. I remember many years ago when I was in New York at four o'clock I would get bored for to see the office of so four o'clock I found myself going down vending machine for a quarter. Comes a candy. Daily routine because you get bored. How do you address bored and boredom? Shortcut. Take a candy. <laughs> so in life also we take shortcuts. And therefore the mind is telling you tell me something, but then I avoid it. But Arjuna had no choice. He was stuck. And Lord Krishna did not cooperate with him. He would have liked to get away from the battlefield, go to forest, to wherever else, but Lord Krishna just did not. So that is what the teacher discovered that here is a place where you are hold. Here is a place where Arjuna has to recognize that there is something there which needs to be connected, just just there. So it is the seven great uh, transformation, Arjuna. How could you say that Arjuna was transformed from being a mamukshu to a jignyasa? Mamukshu is the one who wants moksha or freedom, which everybody is. They go jignyasu. Sadimam, Tvam Prabandham, I am surrendered to you. Please teach me. How did it occur to him? I don't know. All of a sudden, how did the idea come? All of a sudden, from this whole idea of the battle and the conflict going on with the possible death of all these people and the sadness. All of a sudden, this idea that please teach me, how did that happen, Swamiji? I wonder. A warrior, he got transformed into what? An aspirant, a genius. Some karma must be there, some grace must be there. Isn't it? That's not ordinary transformation. And uh, Arjuna kept on, you know, deliberating. What if he been, what if they, there's still the victory and uh, defeat, etc. both in his mind. <coughs> all of a sudden, he says, Karpan Hindu Shurvada Swara, Ucha Mitvam Dhamsa Mura Jeda. Lord, I realize that all along my life, I have always been stuck by the defect of Karpan Hindu. Meaning that I have been a Krupana, I have been a miser been given the great wealth of this intellect and they were using it properly. That the real use of this intellect would have been to do Viveka of what you know I should be doing, what is uh, freedom, what is liberation, what is Atma, what is Anatma. I always use my intellect in this weapon and that weapon and this battle and that battle. Kartanya Dosu, Bhadaswava, I never used this great gift given to me, it's like using a surgeon's knife for sharpening pencil. No? My father is a surgeon, and so I quietly sneak out his knife. <laughs> Similarly, using this putti for all this stuff is like using a surgeon's knife for sharpening pencil. That's what I've done so far, Ajuna says. I've never really carpeted those shokas, I've been kurpana. 
I mean, the mind's like a minute that you don't know the value of the, the gift and the wealth that I, I was given. So this was the grace that Arjuna enjoyed. Naturally, he was in presence of none other than Lord Krishna. And he was a great devotee of Lord Krishna. Okay? He loved him like his, you know, his own self. They say that there is only one self in two bodies, you know, of Arjuna and Lord Krishna. So, that is why uh, there was that transformation. Because from a warrior, and all of a sudden he became an aspirant to a jignasu. So we don't know that process that went on in his mind, do we? The earlier verse says that we don't know whether we may not tell him what is better. And from that all of a sudden he says, Karvanya dosho That's called grace. Something. I guess Lord Krishna must be sitting there and doing something like that. <laughs> He's well known to do that. Sri Mahārāda means says that uh, he himself made Kauravās go at the day. And he made Kauravās to abuse Pandavas, and they angered the Pandavas, and Pandavas make him angry and they fought. He wanted basically to do that job of eliminating all these Kulāsya. So Kauravās are gone, and this is gone, all kinds of... That was his job, and then he left. So how do you uh, make them? They start fighting with each other. So he made a Duryodhana behave in such a way that the Pandavas were angered. Anyway, that is immaterial here. The point is that uh, sitting there, he... so this is a tremendous grace that Arjuna enjoyed that he was transformed from a warrior to an aspirant. And all of a sudden this question came, I don't know if you ever thought about it in his life or not. Shishyasthriyam, Sadhivam, Yashyasya, Nishchitam, Guhidam, These two have been terms, Nishchitam, Nishchaya, Nishchaya, Moksha. Where I want that gain where there is no expense involved. Usually again always involves something to, to be given, some loss is always involved. Every gain is accompanied by some loss is not you pay the price for something. But then what is that gain? I want that gain why I don't have to pay any price. Let's go to Shayasa. Yes, Shayasya. Nishchitam Shayasya. So somehow that came to his mind. Think about it. What happened to Arjuna? All of a sudden he asked. And then of course then the Udesha came. So uh, I don't think that is that very I think it's a unique, a very unique uh, scripture. Because there's a touch of human touch in there. Upanishads are great, of course, but uh, they are all well prepared aspirants. Kasvinda Mago Vinyata, Sarvina Vinyata, Mahoji. Kene Shiram, Patati Prajita Pana. So these questions arise in the mind of those who are very sophisticated people. And Arjuna is not that sophisticated. He is still vulnerable. He is vulnerable to Kama Esha, Kama Esha, You don't find it as you get that in Shweta Ketu. You do not. So, we admire Shweta Ketu as you get that, but then we may, it's easy to identify with Arjuna. Because he represents us more than you know, those others do. So, it's really very dear to our heart because it sort of represents us. And so we can see the process of which, how the transformation happened in Arjuna. So you know what should be done, what should we do? 
and other uh, narrativities that he had in terms of raga dvesha that he also expresses. In terms of his mind, you know, the restlessness of the mind, he expresses very open, very honest, <coughs> very open. Which is what, of course, he desired to should be because when I go to a doctor and still I, I keep things, uh, you know, hidden from the doctor. That's not good. So this disciple is not given any help from the teacher. And so that, you know, I was like very really open, very honest, and express what a difficulty he had. Sanchana Vipana Krishna, Ramati Balavad Garam. My mind is restless, I can't control it. So controlling the mind seems to be as difficult as controlling the wind. It's a very open and honest uh, admission of his difficulty. Or maybe Arjuna is perhaps representing us, I guess. If we think that Arjuna's may not be necessarily a to Arjuna. I don't think he has a restless mind, do you think so? Because Arjuna is very well known for concentration of mind. When his teacher Dronacharya took the test of all these disciples, Arjuna turned out to be one who had the greatest concentration is in Narsa. The teacher had some birds on the top of the branch. And he invited one prince after the other. So he said, What do you see? I see this, you know, I see the sky, I see clouds, they sit down. <laughs> so one by one, Arjuna, what do you see? I see the tree. What do you see in the branch? What do you see in the bird? What do you see the two eyes? What is the right eye? So Arjuna was well known for his concentration. But still he says, my mind is restless, please tell me how to control the mind. So that way Arjuna is very open and also his difficulties are our difficulties. So if Bhagavad Gita is the only text that we find karma yoga. Upanishads don't have that. I give some hints here and there, but no, uh, you know, detailed uh, description or explanation. So that way, Bhagavad Gita is an excellent text, unique text. It helps us because it addresses us. Upanishad addresses Shamaka, addresses Nishikeka, addresses Swedaka. When that question arises in my mind, I will have to wait how many months now. Kaspit Namago Vignate. Oh Lord, what is it knowing which everything becomes known? Why should I worry about knowing everything? When that becomes my concern, then I become a, a, a student for Parisha. Right now, uh, what will I get? What will I lose? What worldly concerns are there? Then I'm closer to Arjuna than I'm closer to Nachike. Although the Chika is very inspiring, you know, and certainly ought to learn from all of them. Arjuna is someone who is very dear and very to one whom we can identify with. So that way, Bhagavad Gita is an excellent scripture to study. <coughs> and Swami is selling that 14 chapter and then completed. Vantra Vimaka Yoga. The Bhagavad Gita, the three Puranas, Sakhram, Elesta, Mekhi, Purana, Prabhupada, Sambhava. Lord Krishna says that these three Puranas are the except for Elesta. Nibad Nanti Mahabharo, these three Puranas, mind, is Atmana, with his body, man. Nibad Nanti Mahabharo, Deenam Abhyam. Abhyam Deenam, the Dehi. The one who is an inventor of the body. But we are the immutable, the immutable, changeless Atma is bound by the body. These Gunanas have the ability to make the Atma identify with the body. And that's how Atma 
takes himself to the body of the Maya being. And that's how the analysis, so if you do an analysis of the human mind in the 14th chapter, that is psychology of Bhagavad Gita, which is an excellent analysis of the mind, Sattva, that the personality A and personality B, and you know, that's how they talk about in management A, and personality and type A, and type A1, and type A minus, and type B, etc. But here, Sattvic, they are just Thomas. And so, uh, and also it tells us a way. The reason why this is being described this way is so that we know what to do. How the Tavas must be overcome by Rajas and that by Sattva. And I think that also has to be overcome. This Trigunya, this Trigunya Bhavadya, Nidhyuta, Nidhya Sattvastha, etc. So, and the Lord Krishna says that may you transcend the three gunas also. So, these three gunas are described in the Buddhist chapter. So, for us to transcend them. Transcend means to recognize that I am ever free from the three gunas. But that we can do only when the mind is stopped, you understand. Oh, I am doing Swamiji, I am doing performing action as a Sakshi. So what do we need to do? Become so, so, sattva, rajas and tamas. This karta, the doer, has to slowly transform from tamas to rajas to sattva. So what we need to do is become sattvic karta. Because karma always requires karta from the doership. And therefore, as long as I am doing something, I am performing my duty, so long Kartratva, the doership is there. So Swami, I am doing Akarada Bhav. I am performing action. People sometimes tell me, I perform action with Akarada Bhav. I don't know what it is. As an action, like a person, I do the action. Now, when you perform an action, you are a doer. Although you can't perform an action. Unless I become a speaker, I can't speak. So before performing any action, I must become a doer of the action, performer of the action. I can't remain actionless and then perform an action. So performing action is prescribed in order to ultimately become free from action, but not while performing action. Then the three gunas are described, sattva, rajas and tamas. Aprakasha, Aprakasha, Munamiyaj Pandava. So, Aprakasha, nothing is uh, clear to this person, Tamas person. Aprakasha, there is no motivation to do anything. Moha, total delusion, confusion. There is a Tamas. Loba, Prabhupati Ranga, Karmana, Ashamaspraha, greed. Constantly performing and one goal after the other. When the rest is predominant, there is no inner satisfaction. So that dissatisfaction drives me to do things one after the other. The dissatisfaction creates a desire prompted by which I perform an action. And that desire is satisfied, but then I'm not satisfied, and therefore the inner dissatisfaction creates another desire. Karmana ashama. There is no cessation of karma at all and the rajas is predominant. So this is a very beautiful chapter giving us an understanding of our own personality. All of us have sattva, rajas and tamas. And so uh, the characteristics of these three gunas are described and uh, for, for us only we go free from them. This three gunas are but for which we should know what the three gunas are. And therefore, the process in our life is uh, from Tamas to Rajas. Arjuna became Tamas. I would say, I will not do anything, I will not fight. That's not the sign of a sannyasa. He thought that was sannyasa. So extremes look alike. 
When a person is sitting like that, and he looks like he is in Samadhi, or he may be simply inside, a lot of battle is going on, I mean, outwardly there is a apparent calm. And so, you know, thought they were sweet for sannyasa. He was sannyasa means just giving up duty, that's all. Because ready to give up duty, who will not be? When duty has become such a big burden, performing duty means what, fighting with these people and killing them, you know, better that Ayikshan where you have to get better than I make the picture. Arjuna wanted an easy way out. Lord Krishna did no much. Lord did not respond. And so that's how Arjuna realized. So, so Tamas. That is why Lord Krishna says, Niyatam Kuru Karmatvam Karmajyayo Ke Karmana Shri Nayatra Vyadaya Na Prasitya Ka Karmana Karmajyayo Ke Karmana Doing something is at any rate better than being in it. Then once we become active, then Lord Krishna says that perform your action without desire, meaning without self-centeredness. But perform action to begin with. Even if Arjuna perform action to satisfy, that is better than not doing something. Although in the world, desire is only in the human being, by the way. The human being performs desire, not practice. You know that. We have always an agenda. Nobody has an agenda. The sun and the moon and the fire and the earth and the water, no agenda. Just to be what they are. And so do what uh, is in their nature. That's why Lord Krishna <coughs> draws our attention to the yajna, the process going on around us. And learn from that. Anad bhondi bhutani parjanya dhanya samavah yajna dhodi parjanya yajna karma samudbhavah On the yajna. Lord Krishna likes that word. May it mean the spirit of self-sacrifice. So that creates a certain thing which uh, creates prosperity outer as well as inner prosperity. <coughs> so Lord Krishna likes yajna, likes self-offering, meaning what? That self-centeredness, which as I say is the primary obstacle of earth. In happiness, let alone spirituality. In fact, self-centeredness is the cause of all of our sadness. We are born with self-centeredness. Because we are born ignorant, therefore we are born with a sense of inadequacy, so we are born with a sense of insecurity, and then we are born with a sense of self-centeredness. And we have spent our life only in fulfilling the self-centeredness, thinking that that is our success, not realizing that is the cause of all sadness. And so Lord Krishna says, first become free from self-centeredness. Then you will proceed further. So that is for yajna, offering oneself. <coughs> so this is how uh, Lord Krishna taught Arjuna. First we become free from tamas, perform action. Arjuna became tamasic. Now you would say, I will not do anything. That is not sattva. There is not sannyasa. Sannyasa also doesn't do anything. So Arjuna thought that I am fit not because of sannyasa, because I don't, he thought that giving up duty is sannyasa. Lord Krishna says you cannot give up karma even if you want. Because karma will not give you up. Even if you want to give up karma, karma will not. Because karma arises from your desire. As long as that is there, you can't give up karma. So you may get into the battlefield, go to forest, you will start cutting trees there, doing something there. You create some battlefield there in the forest. And so uh, karma has to be overcome by the right spirit, by the spirit of offering, spirit of yajna. So that's the first level of freedom. Two levels of freedom Lord Krishna teaches. And in fact, he, uh, Lord Krishna, praises the karma yogi, the sannyas in more than one places. Anasvitah karamalam karyam karma karodhya. The first verse of this sixth chapter. 
Karmakaram Anashita means all depending upon Karmakaram, meaning that you are desiring Karmakaram. Karyam Karma Karodhya performs Karma. Karyam, that has to be done. That's important. Karyam means that which has to be done, which does, without any expectation of personal reward. What is meant by performing action without the expectation of karma phala is not that karma phala will not come when you perform karma, the phala will come. So what is meant by performing action with no attachment to karma phala? It means that there is no personal agenda, that's all. So perform action without, without desire, without karma phala attachment to karma phala. What is meant by attachment to karma phala is that when I perform an action, always a personal agenda. Perform an action without personal agenda. Some agenda has to be there. Without that, action cannot be performed. But not personal agenda. The new agenda, the Nishwara agenda. Or any other agenda or something greater than myself. The idea is to slowly expand myself. Ishwara is a huge thing, I mean, you know, performing action for Ishwara is not that simple. Easier said, thought, mm-hmm. but Ashtakara says performing action. Ishwara Pujya. Performing action, offering to Ishwara. Who is Ishwara, you know? Ishwara is the one who is concerned about everybody. The whole creation is this creation and therefore the well-being of all creatures is in the heart of God. So offering action to Ishwara means what? You are also, you have the spirit of well-being of all creatures. Now that's a huge thing. Start with your well-being. But as a Puja Swami, simplify it. Become a contributor, transform yourself from being consumer to a contributor, right? Consumer means what? Person performing a self-centered action. Contributor means a person performing action for the well-being of others. As well as Swami used to say that when somebody comes before me, the first thought in my mind is how can I be useful to this person? When somebody comes before me, the first thought in my mind is, how can I use this person? <laughs> there are two ways, you know. How can I use you? That's the usual thing I have. What he had was, how can I be useful? You are making yourself vulnerable. You know, you are, I mean, what? You don't know what people will do with you. You will get spied. You will get... But you become vulnerable. If I do that, then they will exploit me. So I want to do good work, but I don't want to be exploited. I don't want other people to use me. But we have to be ready for being exploited. For others to use us. But that's the only way that the self centeredness will go. So, whenever. Fulfilling my personal agenda. Now, perform action. 
action. If I don't have agenda, whose agenda? Others' agenda. That's it, absolutely. Not easy, but that should be our approach to life. How can I do this? We're all serving, they're all doing a good job. Helping others, serving others, feeding others. That's a good training. So keep doing that. In the life also, how can I be useful? How can I help others? With that, blessing to all of you that uh, not only you study well, but then this is assimilated and so it becomes a means for your happiness. Self-growth means happiness. And that's the purpose of studying Vedanta, of course, is to be happy. To become a scholar, of course, is one of the good things, but Ultimately, Vedanta is meant to be. There are many ways of becoming happy that people are prescribing. You prescribe in this way. Study Vedanta. Which talks about us. Recognize the reality of life. Which is how you say Vedanta addresses the reality of life. The three entities in our life, the individual, Jiva, the universe, Jagat, Ishvara the creator. So Vedanta addresses the reality of Jiva, Jagat, and Ishvara. That's all. Vedanta is no other agenda than understanding what is. What is? What is I? What is I? What is Ishvara? And Vedanta thinks that that's enough. How can it be enough? Well, knowing what is, how can it be enough? How it release you from uh, samsara? Because unfortunately I have gone with already a knowledge of who I am. A knowledge of what the world is. Each one knows that. And what each one is, whether a person is educated or not. Each one has already conclusion about who I am, what the world is, and who each one is. In their own way. They don't have to articulate what they think or what they are, but everybody has to have a conclusion on who I am, what the world is, who the is. Those conclusions become the basis of my thoughts or my values, my desires, my action, my life. So Vedanta addresses that. If those conclusions are correct, everything has to be corrected. From those conclusions arises my Goal, my values, and my desires and action. Everything is originating from my basic understanding of Jiva, Jagat, and Ishvara. And that's what Vedanta addresses that. If that is corrected, everything which is following that will be corrected. And the, the emphasis on understanding, on knowledge. <coughs> Very good. All the best to all of you.